Hi, this is Mike Verita. Let's take a look at the new material editor for Maxwell version 2. I'll be working in the Studio application, but if you use Maxwell from a plugin or from the standalone MXED application, uh, that's fine. You'll see the same parameters, the same settings, etc. So here I have a default scene loaded in, in um, Studio simple sphere and ground plane. I've closed all the relevant windows except for those used in material creation. Here I've got a material editor, a color picker, which also doubles as a texture picker, a list of any texture maps used in the scene, and the material list. There are no materials in this scene yet, and the only texture I have loaded is a high dynamic range image I'm using to light the scene. Now first things first, instant gratification. You want a material and you want it right now. Well, there's a material browser where you can browse presets that are uh, that ship with Maxwell or ones that you might have created on your drive. We've got all sorts of car paints and metals and polished stones, plastics, towels, velvet, all sorts of uh, all sorts of presets. And using them is very simple. You can uh, simply uh, grab one, say this this nice uh, wood boards from Arroway and drag it into your material list and uh, it is now ready for use in the scene. You also have this cool little icon up here. You click this. This is, uh, allows you to browse materials in the MXM web gallery online at Next Limit where there are hundreds of, of uh, user created materials. You are free to add to them yourself. You can simply enter a search for something, say metal. It will return all of the uh, materials that match that search criteria and it'll load thumbnails for them and you can see who created them etc. Simply uh, select the material you want, say zinc, and import that material. It'll download it from the website, bring in all of its relevant texture maps, and it too is ready for use in the scene. So if you want to get uh, materials assigned to object and just start seeing renders happen, that's, uh, that's the fastest process. But I want to show you how to create materials because the process is straightforward and then you can make them exactly the way you want. So let's start with a fresh scene here. So to create a new material, there's a couple ways of doing it. One way, over here in the material editor, you can file new MXM. And you see it now shows up over here in the material list. You can right click and rename that. We'll call that ground. You can also create a material right over here in the list by right-clicking and selecting a new material. And we can right-click and call this Sphere. Having created two materials, we need to assign them. You can do that here in the Objects list, assign a material, or you can select an object, make sure it's material selected, and this little icon here in the Material Editor, Apply Current Material to Selection. Now let's just quickly render to make sure that uh, we have a, a successfully rendering scene, we do default material applied to both the sphere and the ground plane. Now the first parameter I want to talk about is the roughness parameter. Put simply, the smoother an object is, that is the lower the roughness, the shinier it gets. Okay? To demonstrate, let's kick off, without touching any of the other parameters, a render at roughness 0 and a render at roughness 25 and a rough uh, re render at roughness 50. Pick up that render and one at 75. The default is 100, so we've already seen that render kick off. The roughness 0 is extremely shiny and, and reflective, looks like a chrome or mirror ball. Roughness 25, a little bit more so, sort of a, an aluminum. 50, it's now even getting rougher and, and less reflective. 75, very, very diffuse. And of course the default 100, completely diffuse. In fact, this 100% diffuse uh, default is known as a Lambert surface, and it is not actually uh, physically plausible. There's no real-world material uh, that has 100% perfect uh, roughness and and for that reason, since it's inherently unphysical, I, I recommend not using it. Uh, the practical upper limit for roughness will usually be around 
95. That's a that's a good that's a good number for your woods and papers and the the base coat for plastics and and that sort of thing. We'll talk more about about that settings, but uh, but that's the general influence of the roughness parameter. So the second parameters I want to talk about are the reflectance parameters, reflectance zero and reflectance 90, and you can think about these like the material's color. Reflectance zero is the color that the material will be at zero degrees from camera that is directly facing camera and the reflectance 90 is the color that you see at the edges at the grazing angles here I'm setting the reflectance 90 color for red so on this object the areas of the object which face camera should be yellow and as it gets toward the edge it should uh, should fade to red let's set this for roughness 40 and and render that very quickly so you can you can see the effect of that you'll see right away here you have some yellow here in the center and the red is starting to show up on the edges because it's blending with the yellow it's turning into a sort of orange and this brings up the first relationship for you to understand and that is the relationship between the reflectance parameters and the roughness put simply the higher the roughness the more the reflectance zero color will dominate the lower ref the roughness the more the reflectance 90 color will dominate Let's illustrate. Roughness 10, that's a low roughness, a shinier object, will have more of this red to its material. It will dominate the reflectance 90. Let's start that render. And if we set the roughness high, say 80, there will be very little of the reflectance 90. It'll be a predominantly yellow sphere. Let's render that and take a look. Okay, here was our roughness 10. You see quite a bit of of uh, of red represented here okay even the yellows are polluted with a little bit of red and here is our high roughness our 80 almost no red at all so it's important to recognize that that this parameter works in concert with these two and it is further important to realize that these colors usually will be a derivative of each other. This is very unusual what we've created here as a material. Generally speaking, you want to have the reflectance 90 a little bit brighter than reflectance 0. And there are some very practical material reasons uh, for, for why you want this color to be derivative of this. And let me show you why using a, uh, a texture example. Let's look at the ground plane material, which right now is uh, is plain. Well, let's load our first our first texture map. And you click on this little icon here, brings up the texture picker. You can use the folder to navigate to, let's say, a checkered floor material. Here it shows up. Here in the texture picker, this icon allows you to increase the size of that if you want to see it. New in Maxwell 2 are image controls. We have controls over brightness and contrast and saturation. Those are extraordinarily useful and helpful especially for this and I'll show you how in just a moment. But let's uh, let's begin by assigning uh, uh, this uh, this texture as it is right here to reflectance 90 and leaving the, ref the roughness at 100. Um, let me uh, render this and show you uh, what the default look is with with this material. Okay, so we have our there's our red sphere sitting on a ground plane, and you see you have the the nice deep blacks and blue of the of the material, the texture just as you just as you anticipate. But as I mentioned, this is using roughness. 100, which is that special Lambert case, and I don't generally recommend using it since a practical upper limit would be 90 to 95. Let me show you what happens if we don't take into account reflectance 90 and we leave it as is. We haven't touched it, we leave it white, and we've only mapped the reflectance 0. Let me show you what happens to the, to the texture material. Right away, see it starts to wash out the texture and this is why I'm showing it to you because this will burn you on every material if you don't take into account what's happening. As I mentioned the reflectance 90 and, re and reflectance 0 colors are controlled by roughness and as the roughness goes down the influence of of the reflectance 90 color becomes more prominent. Well here our reflectance 90 color is a white just a plain white whereas this colored texture map is sitting on reflectance 0 so what's happening is the white is washing out the texture map 
and that'll happen whether you're using a solid color or a texture map or whatever you map into that channel. So this is why your reflectance 90 color has to be a derivative of the reflectance 0. What you can do is just reuse the same map. Here I'm middle mouse dragging this, this map into the reflectance 90 channel. Now I've got the same map loaded in both channels. As I said, generally speaking, the reflectance 90 color is best to be a little bit brighter than the reflectance 0 color. Well, you can use the new image controls to just make it a little bit brighter. Okay, Say 10 points is a good default. Um, the, the actual settings for that vary depending on the material. But as you render now, um, uh, you'll see that even with that lower roughness, we're still getting the proper representation of the map. Okay, so this is this is a crucially important little uh, little function of of reflectance. Reflectance 90 map, a slightly brighter derivation of the reflectance zero map. Now the next parameter I want to talk about is this one, ND, the index of refraction. The simplest way to demonstrate what this does is on a material. Let's go back to our Let's go back to our sphere material. Actually, you know what? Let's create a let's create a fresh material. So as you can see right from 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 the get-go. I'm going to put the roughness down at at 0, which is a completely shiny reflective object. I'm going to assign this new material to our sphere. Let's actually call this Let's rename this chrome. And let's render that. And you'll see, as you expect, a, a chrome ball sitting on our ground plane. But you'll notice the reflection in the sphere is considerably dimmer than the actual uh, illumination on the floor. As I mentioned before, re you know, roughness 0 means that the reflectance 90 color will dominate. In this case, it's fully white. The, the reason it's dim is because this index of refraction setting is relatively low. The default is 3. If you were to raise this to, say, around 20 and render it again, you'll see that the reflections are considerably brighter, much more matching the tonality of the floor. Okay? So in a lot of ways, you can think of the index of refraction uh, parameter as being a, a power or influence uh, um, multiplier for reflectance 90. That's not technically correct, but it'll give you a good understanding of it. The bottom line is, for creating materials, if you're making a shiny material, whether it's uh, uh, something that's metal or chrome, or a shiny component of a material, like the glossy clear coat on a plastic object or on a car, unless you want your reflections to be relatively dim, you're going to need to raise that index of refraction to at least 20 to uh, to get a nice, a nice uh, bright reflection there, and that uh, operating range goes up to a thousand, and you can see the influence up to a thousand if you if you run tests. But this is this is important to know because otherwise you're going to end up with with dim materials. Another gotcha. So just one more time on the relationship. Roughness. The higher the roughness, the more the reflectance zero color dominates. The lower the roughness, the more reflectance 90 dominates. And the index of refraction acts as a power multiplier controller for the reflectance 90. Whether that's and this is true for whether it's a map controlled or or solid color controlled. And you see that's quite a, that's quite a difference in terms of the the reflectivity there. So two two big gotchas. Now I mentioned a second ago that this was true whether or not you had shiny object or a shiny component of a material. And now it's time to talk about the actual building of multi-component materials. In this case, the materials we've been working with are what are known as single BSDF. A BSDF is the basic component of a material. Um, in this case, let's go ahead and, and call this uh, a, a, a base coat. Now let's say you want to make a material like a plastic, a shiny plastic. Well, your first thought might be, all right, well, I want to make a shiny red plastic ball, so I'm going to, I'm going to set my reflectance color. I want it to be red, and I'm going to do like Mike said, and make this just a little bit brighter, and, and I want it to be shiny, so I got my nice high index of refraction, and, and I want it to be shiny, so, you know, uh, I'm going to leave it at uh, roughness 2. 
all right? And, and in your mind, you're thinking you're going to get a red plastic ball. But what you'll actually get is a Christmas ornament. That's because, primarily speaking, materials like shiny plastic are not single BSDF materials. They don't have a single component to them. They have two components. It's not a red shiny ball. It's actually a high roughness base, say 90, and a second layer, another BSDF, which we're adding here. I right clicked, which we can call this the, the clear coat. And this is a low roughness, high index of refraction component. And they're mixed together here. The, the, the way of thinking of, 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 of multiple BSDFs in a material is it's like ingredients in a soup. And this number determines what percentage of ingredients on, in the soup each ingredient has. So let's say we wanted 70% base coat and 30% clear coat. Now the total between all of the BSDFs that you might have in a material, whether you had 2 or 20, should equal 100. If you exceed 100, Maxwell will scale it down for you. But it, it's important and, and a good discipline to get in the habit of always making this number equal 100. You know, 100% of total ingredients in the soup. So now we've mixed in the soup 30% clear coat and 70% base coat. And let's render that. Whereas before we had our Christmas tree ornament, now you're going to see you have more what you're expecting, a red plastic ball. And that's a two-layer two layer material. High diffuse base, shiny clear coat mixed into it. And you can just change the relationships here. You could make this a 10 or 5 even. 5 and then go ahead and fill this one out to 95 so that they still equal 100. And now you'll get the, the same, uh, that's, the, that's the previous one, now you'll get one that's just got less varnish on it, less, less clear coat in it. And for a lot of materials, this is a great approach. Many woods and uh, um, coated surfaces, this is exactly how you do them. And you might use no more than two layers. A clear coat base coat may be how you approach the vast majority of materials, even even wood, which would have a rough, the rough wood, and then perhaps a, a varnish on top. Same approach. And you can control how much of those, uh, those ingredients are in the soup to suit the material that you're after. Now, while this may be appropriate for most materials, the truth is blending BSDFs makes it very difficult to separate the components. It's just like, well, it's like mixing paint. If you had two colors of paint in the same tin, it'd be very difficult to keep them perfectly separate. They're going to want to blend together. Which is why, for Maxwell version 2, we've added a new level of hierarchy, the layer. And the layers can stack one on top of each other, like physically sitting on top of, of, of each other. Let's create a new layer which is now on top. Let's create this and call this the base layer. And let's call this, I don't know, let's call this the dirt layer. I'll show you. Now the layer order matters. Just like in image applications like Photoshop, the layer that's on top, or whichever layers are on top, are the topmost layer, the outermost layer. They sit on top of the base and they can be rearranged. You could now have the base code sitting on top of the, of the dirt. Okay, but whereas uh, base coat and clear coat here as BSD BSDFs blend together, the layers maintain complete independence. So let me show you this in action so you see what I mean. We have our base coat, we have this all set up to do our red plastic. Now we have a fresh material we're creating here as dirt. Let's load a texture map for it. Let's load, um, oh, I don't know, a dirt perhaps. Do I have one? Here we go. Okay, little dirt map. Dirt is highly rough, isn't it? So I'm going to give it a nice high roughness. And again, I'm going to make sure I have my derivative map slightly brighter, slightly brighter for the reflectance 90. Now, where weight map blending has numbers, layers also have 
representative numbers. They're called opacity, or opacity mask. In this case, there's a hundred of each. These do not have to equal a hundred, but because this dirt is sitting completely on top of this base coat, if this is left at a hundred, you won't see any of the base coat. It'll be a hundred percent dirt. So what this actually is, is a dirt sitting on top of our plastic, and you can't see the plastic. But the opacity mask, just like weight map blending does, has a numerical value. You could set it to 50, and now it would be sort of semi-transparent uh, dirt, like a dust sort of a thing, you'll see. Uh, in this render, the, uh, the red plastic will, will shine through the dirt. Let's let that render. So here was our dirt completely on top of the uh, plastic, and here is a uh, half transparent dirt. This is sort of an unusual material. What you could do instead is actually map this. Let's create a texture map for it. Like, uh, well, let's make it obvious. Let's let's actually not. Let's let's grab our checkered floor. It'll be another opportunity to use our image controls. Just turn the saturation down, boost the contrast, give it a little bit more brightness. Now, wherever there is white, there'll, there will be our dirt, and wherever there is black, there will not be dirt. Mask is a, acts as a, an opacity mask. This is going to be an even weirder material, but you'll get the idea. There you go. You can already see the, the dirt showing up in just the checker pattern. So this would be very difficult to do with with uh, uh, BSDFs alone. You'd have to create opposite holdout maps for each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for more complex materials, the usage of of the layer structure will be vastly more efficient, fun, convenient, flexible, etc. Because obviously, you know, uh, here once you've created your your dirt material, you can play with the the way it lays on the material all day long. There's a um, there's another uh, uh, hidden f function in that, and I'll show you that. Let's cancel these renders. As I said, the uh, the dirt is sitting on top of the base coat, and you can see the the opacity mask has been changed to a T here because there's a, a texture, although this is a good time to tell you that this is still active. This is still active as a global control for this map. So if you set this to 50, it'll still retain the layout that it's getting from the map, but it'll also then be only 50% transparent. If we leave this at 100, you see these little dots? These are uh, enabling switches for every component in your material. You can completely temporarily disable a component of material. Now all we have is is our dirt layer and the dirt is being controlled 100% by this map. If we render this, you'll see now only the dirt. Only the dirt. And this is how you create clip maps for things like leaves or or sometimes um, gratings or railings, uh, that sort of thing. Um, it's uh, it's very fast, and uh, and it supports, of course, full grayscale maps. So you can have um, you can have a clip map that has varying levels of transparency in it simply by building that into the map itself. So again, the components are completely separate of one another. And if we turn them both back on, and as I said, if we if we uh, put the dirt below the base coat, well, now you won't see the dirt. Now all you'll have is the red plastic because it's a hundred percent on top of the, the dirt. So this is the the principle behind stacked layers. Here we have only two layers where you can stack multiple multiple layers on top of each other for really complex materials. Maybe you want to make a an aluminum that's been covered up by paint but then some of the paint has been scratched off so you use a, a map for the paint to scratch it off and then there's some dirt on top so you want to put some dirt on top and then use a, a map to have some of the dirt on top and then maybe uh, somebody put a label on it that says fragile and you want to make a label so you make a label layer and you make a mask for the layer and you see for really complex materials it becomes very very fast and easy to create them using using the stack system. Okay, I've reset the scene to uh, illustrate the next set of control parameters. 
um, creating a fresh material. And the, the next set of parameters I want to talk about are, let's start with the bump channel. Okay, I have a default material here. I don't like roughness 100. I'm going to put it down to 90. Let's load a texture into the bump channel so I can show you what this does. And uh, in fact, let's, um, let's load this brick bump map. Okay, let's hide the sphere for a second. And um, let's assign this to the ground plane. Now, before I uh, show you this render, this is a good time for me to show you. Um, you've seen throughout all of these renders, I've been launching full Maxwell in the background to, to preview the materials. But this is a good time to show you about this little preview, preview icon, which will actually render a little material preview right here inside of the material editor, which is quick and efficient and and, uh, and gives you an idea of what your material looks like it, when you have a list, because you see it's now drawn a little icon for it over here. In a lot of cases, this will give you enough information. Um, but if you need to see it uh, in a bigger in a bigger context, you can launch an external render. Now we have the bump map on this channel, and you can see what it's doing. It's creating the illusion of valleys and peaks in this case a little brick texture. It's just an illusion. It's not actually making the surface have depressions in it. Uh, but for a lot of materials this illusion works very very well. In addition, uh, um, there's another type of bump map known as a normal map uh, which can also be loaded into this channel. If you have a if you have a normal map you simply load it in place of the bump map and then enable the normal map switch and then it'll utilize a, a normal map. So some, some map packs come with, with one or the other or both. You can uh, use either. But in both cases, uh, both the bump here and the, um, the normal map, which um, is here, um, they, uh, they are just cheats. They don't actually displace the surface. And if you get down at level with the surface and you look across it, y the effect will, will, uh, will not hold up. To actually displace the surface, you right-click and add a displacement. And a displacement is like a real bump or a real normal map. I probably would disable these uh, if you're going to be using a displacement. And a displacement, you can, again, just load a map. In this case, let's, uh, let's load our brick map. And you have controls for how high it is and uh, how much precision that you use. Generally speaking, this will be controlled by uh, by how many subdivisions are in your mesh. The more finely subdivided your mesh, the greater your results will be with uh, lower precision. You also have an adaptive key for it to, uh, to, um, to work that out on its own automatically. You get uh, different results depending on the, on the object they're using. So we have normal here, bump here, different, slightly different looks. Okay, now here we have a displacement. The displacement does truly, as I said, elevate and raise the surface. And you can see, uh, you can see that's obviously a, a much more physically believable surface because that's what it is. And if you went down to the surface, you'd see full bricks with, uh, with uh, valleys between them. The drawback being, of course, that displacement ma maps are um, are more computationally expensive, so they're slower. But uh, for a lot of materials, there's um, no better way to generate them, and um, and the results are uh, are beautiful. So, so, so the bump map, normal maps, and displacement maps really, really crucial component for uh, for 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 creating, you know, grooves in wood planks or bricks, as you've seen, or dents, that sort of thing. Okay, so bump, normal, displacement. All right. Now, up to this point, uh, we've been talking about solid materials. Let's talk for a moment about uh, transparent materials, things like uh, glass or um, plastics. Okay, right now we have, uh, let's go ahead and re-enable our bump just for the heck of it. Let's turn our sphere back on. Let's worry about the sphere. Now, the sphere needs a material. Let's create a, a, new, a new MXM over here. I'll call this one sphere. 
All right, let's say we wanted to create a glass sphere using what you've already learned, including how to assign a material. Uh, low roughness, right? It's shiny. Glass is shiny. And we, uh, we uh, have uh, reflectance. We can leave those as are. It has no coloring in this glass. And the index of refraction, you want to set it up high because it's, wait a minute. This is all different now because we're talking about a transparent material. Here's another gotcha. This applies to solid objects. And the index of refraction should be high for solid objects, but for transparent objects it has a very different function and a very different meaning. In fact, transparent objects, you can look up on the web, will have very specific index of refraction numbers for different types of materials. For example, the one I've entered here, 1.51, is the index of refraction for typical crown glass. Transmittance is the channel which, uh, which controls transparency. The lighter the transmittance channel is, the more transparent an object is. So for glass, highly transparent. And once you begin adding transmittance, you now need to be thinking about what the real world index of refraction for the transparent material you're creating is. So in this case, even though it's shiny, because it's got low roughness, because it's transparent, we, we approach the index of refraction a little bit differently. And in this case, 1.51. Now, there's one other parameter you have to take into account when, when dealing with transparent materials, and that's the attenuation. The simplest rule to follow for attenuation is that it should be the same scale, same size, as your object. In this case, it's got a drop-down of different units. My sphere has a, has a, uh, a diameter of 10 centimeters, so I'm setting it for 10 centimeters. If you don't set this attenuation, for the size of your object, you won't get predictable results out of your out of your transparency, your glass and stuff. It won't look won't look proper. A lot of times it'll uh, be too dim or it won't be transparent at all. But in this case, we've set the attenuation for the proper size given the sphere that it's attached to. Our transmittance, our transparency is high. We have the proper index of refraction for glass and low roughness. You will now get uh, a beautiful little uh, crown glass sphere sitting on our sitting on our, our bricks. Okay? So just because there's, you know, two more two more parameters involved, I wanted you to be familiar with, with solid materials before getting into, into transparent materials. But now using these parameters and what you've learned about stacked layers or BSDF blending for, uh, you know, super paint ingredients, there's a tremendous number of materials you can build with uh, with just those tools. Now that I've shown you how to build some of these materials manually, it's probably a good time to tell you about the wizards. Wizards are preset generators. So uh, uh, these can save you time. For example, to use one, first always create a new material. It's got to have one to work off of. And then go ahead and for example, if you're going to make a plastic, it'll simply ask you to put in a percentage of its shininess, 30%, uh, a percentage of its roughness, and then a color. And it would, uh, it'll generate a material. In this case, it actually made a, a two-layer material instead of a two-BSDF material. That's uh, a way that I choose to build materials because it's always more flexible. But you get the same look, especially when you use this final column, which controls the blending modes. You have two modes, an additive mode and a normal mode for how the, how the layers are blended together. And that's true um, uh, for, uh, for multi-layer materials. I'll show you the difference in look. Let's go ahead and assign, let's assign this, uh, this generated material, which is now in normal mode. So we've got 100% of each of those layers, right? Well, 100% of those layers, um, all you're getting is the shiny top coat. You're not going to see any of the red base coat because it's in normal mode and it's 100% present. If you slip this to additive, then you see that you can now see it again. So that's an important, important uh, uh, switch to know about is the, um, the use of, of additive mode for things like clear coat, especially, because otherwise 
it'll just completely obscure the the uh, the red beneath it. Okay, I've gone ahead and reset the scene one more time to show you the last material type I want to talk about, which are emitters, those things which cast light into the scene. So let's um, let's create a new MXM. This is just a default material we'll apply to the ground plane. And now let's create a a new material, and we'll call this one the uh, emitter. Let's assign this to the sphere. Okay, now an emitter is a component of a material just like a BSDF is. So you can right click and add an emitter, an emission component. And it'll show up right here next to the BSDF as a default material. And an emitter has uh, um, basically a, there's a color, you can choose a red for it. Um, you can choose its uh, units of measurements from a drop down power and efficacy or lumens, lux, in case you have uh, data. Let's leave them at the default for a second, assigned to our sphere, and just just see what happens when we when we hit render. What you'll see right away is the emitter component is lighting the scene. Now, this emitter is part of a material that has a BSDF in it. You can mix those two together. Uh, so if you had this BSDF, which was left at its default, and you know, and did our shiny BSDF trick. Uh, you'd end up with a shiny illuminating ball. See, it's both reflective and shiny. Okay, whereas that's the that's mixed with the default. Now, because um, it's uh, part of a a layer system, you can map the layer just like you would for any other texture. So, if you wanted to um, take our handy dandy checker floor here and um, and map that to the emitters layer you'd only have emission where there's white in the map so you'll end up with a a checkered illuminations section you know over our shiny you know shiny sphere base they're both held out because of the because of the map now also because it's part of a uh, a layer structure. You could disable the BSDF entirely if you wanted. Um, you could even delete that BSDF component and simply have uh, the emitter component. Uh, in fact, as you as you may have noticed, um, you can actually uh, create an, an emitter, just a standard emitter by itself, which will have no BSDF component, but I wanted to show you that you could, in fact, mix them with BSDFs just like you would any other material component. Now, um, we have a, a number of presets you can choose from, lights that we built, common everyday lights, um, which you can uh, which you can load. In addition to uh, a, a custom color, you can also choose Kelvin temperature. If you happen to know the Kelvin temperature of a light that you're after, uh, again, some, some data you may be man matching from a, a known light source. You can also uh, use an HDR image as the source for your emission. Okay, you just load a texture. In this case I have a an MXI texture that I'm using uh, of, uh, just a, of a green light and you have an intensity control which you can use here for to boost the intensity. Uh, temporarily, just so we can see the effects of this, I'm going to restore the default layout in studio, bring all our windows back, so that I can disable the uh, image-based lighting that I'm using to to light the scene and simply have the emitter here. So with that uh, done, if we render this, you'll see the um, our uh, checkered emitter. Only this time, it'll be uh, it'll be driven by an MXI map, by a high dynamic range map. Okay. So again, you can uh, combine emitters with BSDFs. You could have multiple BSDFs in a material. You can have multiple layers uh, with multiple BSDFs. You could do this all day. You can add displacements. Displacements are the only thing that you can add globally. Uh, it's uh, one displacement for the entire um, material. So if you went to try to add a second displacement wouldn't allow you to do it. Doesn't matter where you where you place it, uh, it'll uh, it'll displace all layers. Okay? 
So uh, I hope this has given you a, a, a good overview of, of the basics for materials. There are a few other settings in the materials we didn't uh, cover, things like the force Fresnel uh, option and, and isotropy, subsurface scattering for effects like uh, leaves or skin, um, and uh, those can be covered in a, in a later tutorial. But even with the, the, the information that you have right now, you can create tons of materials, glasses, plastics, concretes, uh, cloth, wood, um, most everyday materials, uh, and, uh, and quickly, conveniently, creatively, and um, in a really fun way. So, uh, so start loading objects, start creating materials, and um, have fun.